Good afternoon, and welcome to the Cato Institute for our book forum today on the Republican Party Civil War, Will Freedom Win? My name is John Samples. I'm vice president and publisher here at the Cato Institute, and I will serve today as your moderator and host for our discussion of this very interesting and important book. Uh, at the beginning of our event today, I would like to ask each of you to turn off your cell phones, uh, which will, of course, give us some uh, peace as we go forward in our discussions of this book. Um, before introducing our host, uh, our guest today, and our author, I would like to provide a few words of introduction that perhaps are a little idiosyncratic, but at least give us some background for our discussions. Again, the, our book is The Republican Party Civil War, which raises the question of the Republican Party. So I thought I would give us a brief a political, electoral, and policy history, from my point of view in any case, of the, G, the GOP, the grand old party, the Republican Party. The modern Republican Party can be said to begin, I think, for sure, in the 1980 election and the election of Ronald Reagan. No figure more so than Reagan stands, even today, as a exemplar of what the Republican Party um, wants and what it hopes to be. And above all, of course, Reagan won two presidential elections uh, in the 1980 and 1984. And we now have a Republican Party that has lost two presidential elections. Uh, and has not won a majority or a plurality of the vote for now five out of the last six elections. The Reagan era, I would say, is, goes from 1980 to 1997. Reagan, of course, is remembered in uh, many places as not only successful, but as a paragon and advocate of limited government. <laughs> but it's also important to remember that while Reagan did, in some ways, in 1980-81, reduce tax rates and reduce spending at the time, and rather significantly, he only eliminated one major federal program. He reduced a number for a short period of time, but over the, his eight years in office, many uh, spending did rise uh, despite his electoral success. It's also important to remember that the Reagan economic plan from 1978 did not as aspire to actually limit government or pair it back to the, even to the New Deal, and certainly not before the New Deal. Uh, the Reagan economic plan sought to cut back on spending, to lower taxes, stimulate economic growth, and thereby to reduce the proportion of government, GDP, uh, going, uh, excuse me, the proportion of national wealth going to government. And in fact, this happened. The, over the, even over the eight-year period, because of substantial economic growth, in this, particularly in the second term, uh, the um, sum, the part of government, uh, the, the part of the economy, the economic wealth of the country taken by the government did, was reduced over that eight-year period. There was additionally George W. Bush won a presidency. And I think you can even talk about 1994 as a continuation of the Reagan era. But I would say the post-Reagan era begins in 1997. As you recall, that would have been a year or so after the confrontation over Medicare between the Republican House and William Jefferson Clinton. Uh, and also, I would say from 1997 onwards, you see the strength of social conservatism. Uh, evangelical Protestants begin to identify with the Republican Party in serious measures beginning right after 1988 and throughout the 1990s. So the foundations of the party change in many respects, the electoral foundations in the 90s and afterwards. And so you begin to see a different kind of party. Um, not only one that impeaches uh, William Jefferson Clinton, but also one that in the George Bush, W. Bush era, uh, expands government, the Medicare Part D, and also, of course, after 9-11, you began to get wars, nation building, and national security as a central claim on the voters and on policy. And I should point out, you know, in terms of our discussions today, it's important to recall that after for Medicare Part D was a... a uh, part of a policy that from 1994, as early as that, uh, 
uh, some kind of drug coverage for seniors and enjoyed something like 80% support, 70, 80% in polling. And of course, the uh, initially the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq were also politically popular and were thought at the time by some to be a foundation for a generational effort, like the Cold War in a sense, that would help the Republican Party. But that turned out not to be the case. And in, 19, in 2006 and 2008, the Republican Party uh, had electoral disasters that were significant, uh, to put it mildly, and brought Barack Obama and the Obama administration to power. In a sense, I think you can see uh, the Romney effort in 2012 and afterwards as a continuation. Romney was a, was a uh, figure from the Bush era, from the post-Reagan era. So that brings us down to 2012, and the question, now what for the GOP? I would point out that it's been, uh, a, if you accept my uh, eras, that is the Reagan and post-Reagan era, the Reagan era itself lasted about 17 years, and it's been about 17 years since the post-Reagan era began. So we are at a period perhaps of transition for the country, but certainly the Republican Party has the question open, what is to be done now? What, what, what now? And that brings us to our topic today. Uh, our, the Republican Party Civil War will, will Freedom Win. We have with us today the author of the book, uh, Ed Hudgens. Ed is Director of Advocacy and a Senior Scholar of the Atlas Society. He was formerly Director of Regulatory Studies here at the Cato Institute and editor of Regulation Magazine, and is an expert on the regulation of space and transportation, pharmaceuticals, and labor. He <laughs> served as senior economist for the Joint Economic Committee of Congress, and was both deputy director for economic policy studies and director of the Center for International Economic Growth at the Heritage Foundation. He has testified on many occasions before Congress. Both of our guests today have written in all the major papers on opinions, uh, on the opinion pages, and Ed is also editor of Freedom to Trade, Refuting the New Protectionism, as well as Space, the Free Market Frontier, and two books on postal service privatization. He also edited the collection, An Objectivist Secular Reader. Welcome back to Cato, Ed. Thanks a lot, John. PowerPoint queued up. Ah, there it is. Okay, good show. Um, all right. Um, yeah, I want to uh, start by thanking uh, uh, John and uh, for and the Cato Institute for organizing this uh, book forum, and thank Henry for coming along to make comments, which we'll hear very, uh, very shortly. Um, the Republican Party, I believe, is in crisis today. Um, the, in three of the last four national elections, the GOP has lost, including, as John pointed out, two presidential elections. Um, I suspect that the uh, GOP has a pretty good chance of winning uh, the Senate in the fall of uh, this year, 2014, but that's not going to take away the fact that there's an underlying crisis within the GOP. Now, my thesis today is going to be fourfold. First of all, I'm going to argue that the Republican Party's problems can be understood in terms of a three-way internal civil war between three factions. Second, that the GOP is in a demographic decline, that it faces underlying problems that whether it wins uh, this, uh, uh, the Senate this year or not, are not going to go away. Number three, I'm going to suggest that the factions of the GOP need to unite behind a freedom agenda, uh, or in some cases, they, the factions might have to seek political refuge elsewhere. And finally, I'm going to suggest that the GOP desperately needs to transform itself into a modernist, future-oriented party uh, to attract new blood or to die as the country sinks into servitude. Now, this talk is going to be both analytical and aspirational. I'm going to offer my analysis of what I think the possibilities are, but I clearly have an agenda here. I think that the freedom agenda is one that should be uh, uh, pushed, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Okay, let's go straight to the first part of the talk. I want to talk about 
the three-way civil war. And who are these actors? Well, first of all, you have the establishment Republicans. Uh, these are the folks who see the greatest problem facing the country as dysfunctional government, inefficient government. Uh, the key here is that these Republicans want to retain the welfare state, uh, either because they think it's a morally good thing uh, for the government to provide goods and services of certain sorts, uh, insurance and so forth, or because they think it's impractical to eliminate it. Um, in some cases, of course, these uh, establishment Republicans seek to expand the welfare state, as we heard, uh, George W. Bush uh, expanding entitlements uh, in, uh, in uh, Medicare, uh, Romney with Romney Care at the state level, clearly examples of this. Uh, those establishment Republicans with a neoconservative bent uh, are pretty much outright social engineers of the right. Uh, that's how they conceive themselves. They want to tinker. They want to redo society. It's just that they want to redo it a little bit differently than the left wants to do it. Uh, these establishment conservatives often focus most importantly on winning elections. And then they say, well, once we win, we'll sort of tinker around a little bit. But we really have to work first and foremost on winning elections, saying whatever it takes to win the elections. They're pragmatists in the bad sense of the word. Um, and then they will seek some reforms. They will seek tax cuts. They'll be perhaps fiscally responsible. You can certainly see this at the uh, state level uh, with a lot of the governors, uh, GOP governors. Um, they can either be socially conservative or mixed. Uh, Romney declared himself to be a social conservative. You have people like Schwarzenegger at the state level, uh, you know, who are more socially liberal. But the point is they really don't give a big priority to social issues. So those are the establishment Republicans. The second faction are what I call the extreme social conservatives. And these are the folks who see uh, the greatest problem in society today, facing society today, as the breakdown of traditional morality and institutions. And they tend to favor public policies that actually limit liberty. Uh, obviously, banning abortion is a top one. There's some, there's, you know, the, you can, you could maybe be honest on that, you know, that side if you really think it's life, but some of the things really go, uh, I think, beyond that sort of thing. Uh, for example, why ban gay marriage? It doesn't, buy, it doesn't interfere with anybody else's liberty. It doesn't kill anybody. Uh, and a lot of the attitudes, I think, of social conservatives towards immigrants uh, uh, are based on this fear of changing uh, institutions, changing uh, traditions, and so forth. Um, these folks obviously give priority to the social issues. That's their big thing. Now, they lean towards free markets quite often, but not always. Uh, if you take a look at Mike Huckabee, for example, when he was governor of Arkansas, uh, he favored a lot of state policies because he said, well, they help the family. And to quote uh, Rick Santorum, the basic unit of society is the family for the most uh, extreme of these uh, neo, uh, for these uh, social conservatives. And um, uh, by the way, I have a number of nice quotes here from Santorum just to show that I'm not making this stuff up. This whole idea of personal autonomy I don't think that most conservatives hold to that point of view. And he is very critical of the libertarianish right. He, well, his, his criticism right here is, I have this, uh, the libertarians have this idea that people should be left alone, be able to do whatever they want to do. Government should keep our taxes down, keep our regulations low, uh, and that we shouldn't get involved in the bedroom. We shouldn't get involved in cultural issues. You know, people should do whatever they want. Sounds good to me, um, but apparently not to Mr. Santorum. Uh, he says that freedom in the Orwellian, uh, his Orwellian language, freedom is the freedom to attend to one's duties, duties to God, family, and neighbors. So this is a very anti-individualist uh, perspective that some of these extreme social conservatives have. Final faction, what I would call the traditional Goldwater, Reagan, or libertarian-oriented Republicans. Uh, they see the greatest problem as government, big government, and the loss of individual liberty. These are the folks who opposed Obamacare, who want to cut back the size of government. They favor rolling back the welfare state. They're not simply uh, uh, satisfied with tweaking it. Uh, now, they can be socially uh, liberal or they can be mixed. Some of them are uh, very conservative personally, but the point is that they give priority to cutting back government. And just so uh, that the Santorum quotes will not depress you completely, I decided to put in uh, the opening line from the Republican Party platform of 1980, the beginning of the Reagan era. It has long been 
a fundamental conviction of the Republican Party that government should foster in our society a climate of maximum individual liberty and freedom of choice. And if you read that platform, it's pretty inspirational. Um, didn't do it all, but there it is. So those are the three factions that are fighting today. And I'm going to talk about the subtleties within those factions a little bit. But I want to go now and talk about the background uh, of this civil war and what's going on. And specifically, the Republican Party is in a demographic decline. And uh, let's take a look at a couple of groups. They've been losing Hispanic votes. Um, Hispanics, I'm talking about, by the way, citizens, not, uh, not illegal immigrants uh, who presumably can't vote. In uh, 2004, Bush got 48% of their vote. Uh, McCain got 31%. Romney only got 27%. Hispanics today are about 17% of the population. In 2050, they will be 30%. And they constitute very strong voting blocks in some of the states that have either been solidly Republican or are swing states, such as Texas, Colorado, Florida. Whites, well... The Republicans have done pretty well, 58, 59%. They tend to get white votes, okay? But uh, in 1990, whites constituted 77% of the population. Today, it's 64% and declining. Again, Republicans are in a demographics problem here. White evangelicals. Romney got 78% of the white evangelical vote. And by the way, 48% of the uh, GOP primary voters in 2012 were classified themselves as evangelicals. Um, good? Well, not necessarily, because again, they are a declining portion of the population. And this is a very interesting statistics. If you look at people 50 to 64, 29% uh, classify themselves as evangelical. Only 11% say no religious affiliation. Of 18 to 29-year-olds, the next generation, the millennials, only 12% are evangelical, 35% no religious affiliation. That's what Republicans are looking at. Finally, let's talk about young people. Uh, again, you can see that um, Repub young people went only 37% for Romney. It's been sort of gradually declining, a little bit of a boost from uh, McCain. But the young people tend to be more socially liberal. And the old-fashioned appeals don't tend to work on them. This is a fascinating number here. Asked wh whether you have a positive or negative reaction to the terms capitalism or socialism, Take a look at the socialism thing there. 49% uh, of 29, 18 to 29 year olds had a positive reaction to the term socialism, whereas only 31% of the other the general population have uh, a, a positive reaction. So you can see with these numbers that the GOP is facing some very serious demographic challenges. So. What I'm arguing is that, and this is where I sort of get aspirational as well as analytical, GOP must unite for liberty. First of all, it can't survive in its current form. And unfortunately, the sides are pretty much evenly matched, even in terms of their war chests. Karl Rove, who's an establishment Republican, calls himself a conservative, but realistically, he's an establishment Republican, uh, raised about $300 million uh, during the last election cycle. The Koch brothers, depending on what, how you classify the money, were somewhere in the same ballpark. And the religious coalition, the, the social conservatives, were kind of behind the, 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 in this area, but they had a big meeting here in D.C. in December to try to beef up their war chest as well. So you have a lot of money backing the three factions and explicitly thinking about, we got to get our agenda out there. Um, what I'm going to suggest is that I'm going to offer an appeal, as it were, to each faction on why they should back the liberty perspective. And I'm going to suggest that it's not just so they can get elected. It's for the good of the country. They have to take a principled stand in favor of liberty and take the moral high ground. Okay. What about the libertarians? Obviously, what the, or the Reagan Republicans, if you prefer. Um, they are the bearers of the aspiration of a limited government, a government put back into its place, uh, of uh, protecting life, liberty, and property and rolling back the welfare state. Now, uh, I'll just mention that these uh, more libertarian or traditional Republicans come in two flavors. There are the Enlightenment types who uh, really see the human potential uh, offered by freedom. And then there are more traditional types, more like the Edmund Burke types, who believe, well, yeah, human nature is kind of corrupt, but you know what? It's going to be even worse if government is in charge because they're going to screw things up you know, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, a lot of terrible ways. 
But here's what I say, especially the Enlightenment uh, libertarians must, and their role is to articulate, to make real, to educate the public and voters about the value for, of liberty. They have to have the right rhetoric. I like to say this is real life, not a philosophy seminar. I'm all for philosophy seminars. I've conducted philosophy seminars. This is kind of a philosophy seminar right here, okay? But when you're actually doing politics, you have to think in terms of rhetoric. You have to think in terms of how can I make this real? How can I sell this idea? And that's a role that libertarians can play. They have to make a positive appeal because remember, and as you'll see in a minute, or the negative appeals tend not to work, especially with the younger uh, voters. Uh, have to realize that uh, what it takes to win elections, it, that, that you have to win elections if you want real change, you have to build coalitions. You, they have to pick their battles. A lot of times libertarians think, well, we're just going to stand up and demand utopia. It took decades to get to the place where we are today. It's going to take a while to get out. So to that faction, I say, let's be realists. Let's pick our battles. Let's be intelligent about it. What about establishment Republicans? Well, um, a lot of establishment Republicans have valid concerns about social conservatives losing elections. You can look at Todd Akin in Missouri. You can look at Murdoch in, in uh, uh, Indiana. You can look at Cuccinelli in Virginia. That was a governor's uh, uh, race there. Even though Cuccinelli didn't run on social issues, the Democrats effectively brought back his uh, pronouncements on social issues uh, to defeat uh, him. That's a valid concern that establishment Republicans have. But first of all, they haven't been doing a very good job getting elected either. I mean, McCain, Romney, okay? Um, and again, there are two flavors of establishment Republicans. There are those who actually favor the welfare state, more of the neocon type, and then there are those who believe that it's simply, too, it's simply futile to resist the welfare state. And you know, to those I say, their failure to make the freedom case is one of the reasons why it's so futile or seems so futile to oppose the welfare state. They, in a sense, know better. They know that the current system is broken, that it's going to collapse. Um, and yet, you know, they, 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 they uh, fail to make those points. Um, they're right to pick our battles, but they must uh, act on principles. They must understand the welfare state is in a collapse. It's, all they're doing is slowing it down. It's going to collapse, okay? So they really have to get behind the freedom agenda. Finally, social conservatives. What is the appeal I make to social conservatives? Well, first of all, I point out that I believe they're morally wrong to try to impose their views on other people as long as other people are not, uh, or government is not limiting their liberty. But going beyond that, I say that, first of all, they're losing on their hot button items, especially uh, same-sex marriage. They're going to lose on that. They're losing already. But what they're doing by putting all their attention and money and efforts into that is, in a sense, uh, empowering the left. The left can point to them as, as idiots and as extremists and so forth, and that's one of the ways they win elections, like in Virginia. Um, and they divert resources away from the real battle. Um, you know, and in the long run, their value choices are going to be limited and strangled if the welfare state and if the state continues to um, uh, continues to grow. Okay. Um, by the way, they're going to go after homeschooling, so social conservatives better uh, figure that part out. Um, what I'm suggesting is there are two types of social conservatives. There are the types who really give a priority to um, the social issues, and then there are ones, for example, in the Tea Party, about half Tea Party folks classify themselves as social conservatives. But the priority for a lot of these folks is to scale back government. That should be the, where the priority is. Now, some of them have said that if the GOP doesn't go along with a social agenda, if the GOP backs same-sex marriage and so forth, they're going to walk. Mike Huckabee is an example. Now, I say, let them leave. Rather have them in, but let them leave. And the reason is because these kind of social conservatives are getting in the way of what really needs to be done. That brings me to my final points here, and that is uh, the need to reach out and to bring new blood into the GOP to make it uh, a modernist party. Reach out to Hispanics. There, the appeal should be to self-betterment. Uh, Hispanics, uh, these are citizens, resent the attitudes of a lot of conservatives and Republicans towards illegal immigrants. Um, I think they see the GOP as bigoted. But the GOP should celebrate the values of illegal immigrants 
That is those who say, I'm gonna to refuse to live in poverty and destitution in my country. I'm gonna to refuse to sit here because a bunch of bureaucrats and operacheks in the United States can't get their act together to come up with a system that allows me to go in uh, to the country uh, legally. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna act for the best of, my, for, of myself and my folks. I'm gonna come across the border illegally. I'm gonna stand in front of Home Depot. I'm gonna work my ass off and I'm gonna uh, realize the American dream. Those values should be celebrated. Okay, another group that should be brought in, young people. Um, and here we can out reach out in terms of ideals, showing a bright future. Young people, I'm talking about the millennials today, tend to be very cynical and detached. Politically, about half of them millennials are uh, classify themselves as politically independent compared to only 37% of baby boomers. Uh, 31%, only 31% see a difference between Republicans and Democrats to begin with. Um, this is interesting. Um, they're delaying marriage, but surveys show that even more than baby boomers, they see raising a family as being important. They still have that aspiration, very interesting. They're looking towards the future. Life goals, this is very interesting too. A survey found that 74%, they're using first year college freshmen here, of millennials um, saw being financially very well off as a top goal compared to only 45% of baby boomers. In other words, the millennials are saying, show me the money, right? Um, finally, even they, they do consider community to be important, but they're very distrusting of people. But here's, here's where the appeal comes in. They love technology. They love uh, the, the, the possibilities of technology. I mean, every single one of them has one of these. Every single young person has, uh, uh, you know, again, it, uh, people like me who are older, you know, they wouldn't even know what a typewriter is. They wouldn't even know what this technology is, right? This is something they love. They're socially liberal. Uh, they don't want to be associated with a GOP they think are uh, dominated by bigots. They're for civil liberties. They don't like the spying state. They need a vision to be offered to them of how, what life can be and should be. This is something that a GOP could possibly offer. Finally, outreach to what I call modernist achievers. And here, the appeal is to reason, individualism, and love of creation. There's a whole group of the folks the entrepreneurs, the inventors, who have created the information and communications revolution, who are doing incredible things with medical devices and medical technology, internet privacy, um, space travel, mm -hmm. Tesla, Uber, the, 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 uh, the car service, driverless cars. I could do a whole talk. I have given whole talks on these incredible inventions, the incredible applications of technology today by what I call these modernist achievers. But a lot of them are now understanding that they're under attack by government. Uh, government is trying to restrict them. There's a group called 23andMe that offered genetic tests. The FDA said you can't offer the genetic test because not that your information is wrong, but the public is too stupid to read their own medical information and make the right decisions. Literally, read the FDA th thing. Um, they're trying to shut down Uber, uh, uh, the Uber ride sharing services at, at the local level. Tesla sales, direct sales have been banned in New Jersey. A lot of these young entrepreneurs are getting frustrated with the government now, as well they should be. But here is the good news. And then this is, I'm almost done here. Here's the good news. These achievers have exactly the right values. First of all, they appreciate the power of human reason to change the world for the better. Second, they understand the importance of the individual. They are individualists. They pursue their own visions. And they love their work. I like to say they have the values of a Howard Rourke. They need the politics of a John Galt, for those of you who've read Ayn Rand. Uh, I love this quote from Steve Jobs. Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice, and most important, have the courage to follow your heart and tuition. Uh, that's the kind of spirit that these folks have, and that's the kind of outreach we have to do to those folks, is to say we want to, the GOP wants to bring them in and offer a freedom-oriented modernist uh, party. Okay, let me summarize here. I talked about the civil war within the GOP. But the real civil war is going on in this country. 
It's between the makers and the takers, between a class that survives by getting government favors uh, and a class of producers who are being penalized for production. And more basically, it's between individualists, individualism, and collectivism or collectivists. That's where the real problem is. The contradictions of the welfare state uh, simply cannot be overcome. The GOP has been part of the problem. It needs to be part of the solution. It needs to offer both a freedom vision, it needs to seize the moral high grounds, it needs to work uh, for a consistent freedom, liberty agenda if it is to succeed and if the country is to survive and flourish. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ed. Um, I knew Henry Olson uh, for some time, but in the really got to know him pretty well a couple, three years ago when we were out at, uh, along with a number of other people, for an event at the Reagan Ranch. And as part of that, if you've ever been to the Reagan Ranch, which I had not been until then, it's a very isolated place. You have to take a long and winding road up there in a, in a small, as it turns out, in a Jeep. So Henry and I and a newly elected member of Congress named Todd Rokita from Indiana uh, found ourselves in a Jeep with a 20 to 30 minute ride up to the Reagan <laughs> Ranch. And uh, we fell into talking about, well, what would you expect, politics. And what struck me about that, that memorable ride was, was that uh, Henry knew as much about Todd Rokita's district and the surrounding districts, as Todd Rokita knew, <laughs> which is pretty stunning, not knowing anything about central Indiana politics. Uh, so when Ed approached us with an idea about having a book for him on his book about the po political future and po involving political data, Henry popped right into mine. We've known each other and talked also and subsequently. And Henry, is, I've always found Henry's knowledge of politics extremely impressive and his arguments uh, certainly need to be something that libertarians and others hear. Henry Olson, our uh, commentator today, is a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, where he studies and provides commentary on American politics. His work focuses on how to address, consistent with conservative principles, the electoral challenges facing modern American conservatism. This work will culminate in a book entitled New Century, New Deal, how conservatives can win hearts, minds, and elections. And maybe we'll have both of these people back for when that book comes out. And so if you'll be the commentator. <laughs> uh, Henry has worked in senior executive positions at many center-right think tanks. He most recently served from 2006 to 2013 as vice president and director of National Research Initiative at the American Enterprise Institute. He previously worked as vice president of programs at the Manhattan Institute and president of the Commonwealth Foundation. His work has been featured in many leading publications. His pre-election predictions of 2008, 2010, and 2012 have been particularly praised for their accuracy, so maybe you should say something about 2014 today. Uh, Mr. Olson started his career as a political consultant at the California firm of Hoffenblum Mulrich. He then worked with the California State Assembly Republican Caucus before attending law school. He served as a law clerk to the Honorable Danny J. Boggs, who has some Cato uh, connections, on the U.S. Appeal Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, and is an associate at Deckard Price and Rose. He has a BA from Claremont McKenna College and a JD from the University of Chicago Law School, where he served as a comment editor for the University of Chicago Law Review. And this will be Henry's first appearance, I think, at a That's Cato right. panel. We hope there's more. Welcome, Henry. <laughs> The quotes from Rick Santorum just brought to mind uh, how different the worldview is between the libertarian and the social conservative. And I want to encapsulate that with a quote that I heard when I lived in Los Angeles in 1984, ran in conservative and libertarian circles. And I had friends who were objectivists who told me that the presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party that year, David Berglund, had been interviewed recently on tel a morning TV show where the where the female uh, host breathlessly said, is it true, Mr. Berglund, that libertarians believe that two consenting adults ought to be legally able to do whatever they want in the privacy of their own bedroom? <laughs> to which he very calmly replied, why do you limit it to two?
Now, I mentioned that at the start, uh, besides <laughs> the fact that's a, hilarious, a funny story, because the idea of uh, that is the wholly voluntary society that is unconstrained by traditional mores, uh, that the wholly voluntary society is something that we ought to be uh, striving towards. And that's a view that Edward, I think, uh, very ably puts forth in his book and in his presentation today. And what I'd like to suggest to you is that the data suggest that Americans are nowhere near ready yet to take the great leap forward into consistent libertarianism. It does not mean that there are not libertarian-ish elements that are popping up in political debate that we can see in the data. But as libertarians, I'd like you to look at the data because that's the political environment in which you will be arguing. Um, I personally am not a libertarian. I've called myself a conservative who loves liberty or a freedom con, depending on where you put that, which is to say that I'm probably considered a rampant status by many of the people in the audience. I disagree personally with the formulation of maker versus taker or individual versus collectivist that you put forward. And I think the data suggests that most Americans would disagree with that as well. But what I wanna focus on today is simply looking at the data. Are there political opportunities for a Republican Party that is devoted not to libertarian-ish, soft libertarian principles, but rather to a much more consistent view of hard libertarianism along the lines that Edward? Does that coalition exist? Does, is that something that is only being held back by an alliance with social conservatives? And I believe that the data suggests very strongly that that view uh, is, is false. Uh, I believe the data also suggests that there are elements of libertarian-ish, softer libertarianism, which is achievable, but can only be achieved in coalition with other groups with whom you will have significant disagreement on other issues because of their inconsistent application of the voluntary society principle. So that to the extent one wants to look at a short to medium term political strategy for libertarian ideas, not a long term one that may pay off with a larger uh, libertarian part of the body politic in 20 years, but rather one that will have traction in the next two, four, six, 10 years, that that's really the practical choice that people who are hard libertarians face in this country. Now let me turn to the data. Uh, Ed's uh, actually uh, got the factions of the Republican Party down pretty right. Um, I would not necessarily give the same names to them, but um, I recently wrote a piece called The Four Faces of the Republican Party, at which I was looking more at the presidential level than at the congressional level. At the congressional level, one of those factions that I'm going to mention, the moderates, tends not to be present in a large degree. They come out in presidential primary years. They do not tend to participate in Republican Party primaries otherwise. So for most elections, I would say the three factions that Ed lays out are pretty right. Um, and he's got them pretty, again, a little quibbling, but he's got them pretty well right as far as their priorities, what they believe, what they don't believe, and so forth. Um, of course, they differ in numbers in different states. Clearly, uh, what he calls extreme social conservatives, and I simply call social con religious social conservatives, are much stronger in the mountain states, in the plains, and in the uh, south uh, and, the, and the border states of the south, whereas the establishment Republicans are extremely strong in the old states in the northeast, the Midwest, they tend to be the strongest dominating faction, but not as much as they are in the Northeast. Um, and you can see where that plays out in different primaries, that there's no successful Tea Party challenge in Massachusetts, whereas there are successful Tea Party challenges in the Deep South and, and the Plain States. Um, but in presidential primaries, there is a, uh, what I see from the data from exit polls that have come out over the last um, four presidential cycles, or actually over the last six presidential cycles, is that there are four factions in Republican presidential elections. One, the largest group is what I call the somewhat conservative voter, and what I think would roughly correspond with the establishment Republican voter. Um, this is a person who is well described by Ed, uh, doesn't care much about social issues, prioritizes uh, wealth creation, uh, but is not extreme either in disposition or in their politics, um, uh, unhappy with the welfare state, but not particularly eager to repeal it. They are the largest single faction in national Republican politics. 
they tend in states to be somewhere between 35 and 40 percent of the population of people who actually vote in Republican presidential primaries. They are moreover relatively evenly distributed throughout the country, which is to say that religious conservatives are found in much higher proportions in Alabama than they are in New Hampshire, but social cons uh, somewhat conservatives or establishment Republicans are found roughly in similar percentages. They are the bedrock of the Republican Party. And moreover, since the beginning of exit polling in Republican primaries, they're the only faction to never lose. They're the faction that wins all the time. The second largest group is strangely the moderates. And you'd say, what moderates vote in Republican primaries? Well, the fact is, in regular primaries, they don't vote very much. But in presidential years, people who are registered independents or moderate Republicans do come out and vote. And they are extremely important in Northeast and Midwestern states. In fact, New Hampshire, that bellwether, prime, the first primary state in the union, is a moderate bastion. Nearly half of Republican voters uh, in 2012 said that they were moderate, not any stripe of, or liberal. There is actually a few people who say they're liberals who show up, but they are less than 5%. Moderate or liberal is nearly half, and it's always over 40%. Uh, New Hampshire will go to a candidate that is favored by not the establishment conservative, not the Tea Party conservative, not the social conservative, but will go to the candidate favored by the moderates. Um, Michigan is a strong state for them. They're unusually strong in Florida. Nearly 40% tend to be moderate in Florida. Um, this is a group uh, that is very uh, supportive of existing welfare state measures, but very opposed to social conservatives. They will... Uh, line up behind a candidate who is opposed to social conservatives in a thinly veiled or outwardly way every single time. Um, the third largest group is the social conservatives. They're roughly a fifth to a quarter of the electorate. And in 2016, we may see that be a little bit smaller, again, because many social conservatives overlap with the Tea Party types. Um, they dominate in the South. They dominate caucus states in the Midwest. The social conservative will win the Kansas caucuses, will win the Minnesota caucuses, is extremely likely to win the Iowa caucuses if one develops, uh, because they are very motivated to go out and vote. Um, and the uh, candidates favored by social conservatives will win virtually every primary in the deep south and be very competitive in states like Tennessee and Texas and South Carolina and North Carolina that border the deep south. And then the smallest group in the Republican primary is the fiscal conservative libertarian-ish voter. The candidate favored by that faction tends to get wiped out in early primaries, tends to lose early, um, and tends to uh, end up throwing their support to uh, the candidate who is favored by the establishment Republican because the alternatives uh, tend to be people that they for various reasons, do not like because of their stands on tax and spending issues. McCain uh, in 2000 being a perfect example of that, where Steve Forbes gets annihilated pretty quickly and immediately backs George W. Bush because for whatever misgivings he has about Bush, at least Bush is in favor of cutting taxes in some way, whereas, George, whereas Tom, uh, John McCain had ruled out any tax cut um, uh, for the top earners. Um, so what that means is that when you look at the Republican Party, as it's currently formed in the presidential level, there is not a majority for a hard freedom candidate to put together on a hard platform. That's why you have Republican candidates who make overtures to freedom conservatives and make overtures to hard libertarian viewpoints, but do not actually endorse them. So for a freedom candidate to be able to win on a more hardcore government reduction platform, they need to bring in new voters. And that's essentially what the strategy that Rand Paul is pursuing right now and the strategy that his father pursued slightly in the 2012 race. If you look at where Ron Paul ran, did best in 2012, he did most strongly, of course, among young people, but he did most strongly among people who were self-described moderates, not people who were self-described conservatives or very conservative. He was bringing in disaffected young people uh, who were not natural Republicans who would cross over to vote for him. So what does that mean for Rand Paul's chances? Um, Rand Paul's chances essentially rely on his building a very odd alliance uh, between new voters who are libertarian-ish on issues like defense and privacy and technology uh, because if he's from Kentucky, he's not going to go 
on the gay marriage side that you would advocate, which will be a weakness in his being able to pull these voters in. But he needs to bring them in and ally them to the fiscal conservative side. And then if he were to get through Iowa, he could easily win New Hampshire. If he got through that, he would be competitive in some of the other non-Southern states. And the likely alternative would be, given the way Republican primary electorates have gone in the past, is that um, a social conservative, if they were winning in Iowa, would then go to the Deep South and do quite well. And you could very easily see something that happens for the first time in modern history, which is no establishment Republican candidate making the final cut. That's Rand Paul's path to the nomination, is to get through the early primaries in the top two and then be squared off against a hardcore social conservative who, because they don't care about social issues much, the establishment Republicans would hold their, no you know, hold their noses and back Rand Paul. But the thing to be really cognizant about is that doesn't mean these no vo new voters are libertarian. Um, when you look at the types of new voters that would, might be brought in, you mainly are talking about young, mainly white voters. Um, and young voters have libertarianish sentiments on question like wealth creation and regulation, but they're actually quite supportive of large government in many ways. I did a piece on this called Rand Paul's Party that was in National Review uh, a year or so ago. And what I found was that uh, looking at Pew data, that this group, uh, that would be the wealth creator group, or we're called by Pew postmoderns. And they're very similar to libertarians in education, in wealth, in where they live, in their religiosity, in their support of Wall Street, and their belief in hard work. But they happen to overwhelming light like Obama. They did not think the national deficit was a top priority. They preferred expanding alternative energy sources over using market-oriented fossil fuels. They supported gun control. They tended to say government should not be smaller. They preferred a larger government that provided more services. And they tend to like the UN, unions, and Obamacare. Other questions suggest that they like, uh, for example, um, government efforts to reduce obesity. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a better noir among the people I'm speaking with, but in fact, the people that you're trying to attract who have libertarian-ish views do not share the voluntary society principle across the board. If you make coalition with them, that will limit your possibilities of political success. There is no magic bullet for hardcore libertarianism to attract the third group of what you're talking about, the wealth-creating entrepreneur. So what about youth more generally? Well, you can easily exaggerate the youth vote. Uh, and their importance, uh, because most of the statistics forget to correct for racial and ethnic composition. That the youth 18 to 29 vote is the most non-white part of the electorate. About 28% of the national electorate is non-white. Over 40% of the 18 to 29 year olds are non-white. So what I did is I compared like to like. How do 18 to 29 year old African Americans look compared to 18, you know, 30 plus? African-Americans and whites and so forth. And you do find a youth effect, but it's mo only about five to seven points. White youth voted for Romney with 51%. Now, older Americans voted for Romney 58 to over 60%. So it's not inconsiderable, but it's not massive that even in 2012, white, two th uh, and the same is true with Hispanics, Asians, and blacks, is that you see they're slightly to the left, slightly more democratic. And we also don't know if this is a composition effect. One thing we find is that turnout rises substantially as you age. Are these people more likely to be politically motivated than somebody who is a college dropout who may start voting when they have a family in their 30s? Might that, since the Republican Party tends to attract greatest support among non-college educated whites right now, if there is that composition effect, the Republican vote in this cohort will rise naturally as people who are not voting in their 20s naturally return to the voting platform as every other generation does as they age and have more responsibility. So I think you can easily exaggerate the degree to which young people are a natural constituency. So then what about Hispanics? It's true that Hispanics 
are turned off largely by an anti-immigrant uh, uh, platform. An anti-immigrant platform is kind of a conversation closer. I don't think you should be in this country. Please vote for me. Doesn't usually work very well. <laughs> However, you know, it, um, if you have a conversation, then you have a conversation. And the question is, are Hispanics largely receptive to a hard libertarian appeal? Are they even susceptible to a soft libertarian appeal? The data suggests strongly not. The data suggests that when you ask, do you, at you know, the broadest level, do you support bigger government that provides more services or smaller government and, and lower taxes? That, that question that gets over 50, you know, uh, 50 percent of Americans nationally to support in concept a smaller government uh, goes two to one the other way among Hispanics. About two to one, Hispanics support larger government to smaller government. And that's true even among the subset of, of uh, Hispanic evangelicals who are supposedly, you know, they are socially conservative, they are more Republican in their voting habits, but as far as their attitude on hard, lib or soft libertarianish appeals, they don't respond to that. White evangelicals, by the way, are reversed. They're about two to one in favor of smaller government, despite. And again, that gets into the, some of them are social conservatives first, and some of them are more broadly. Um, over 80% of Hispanics support a minimum wage hike. Um, there was a question that was asked in the Public Religion uh, Research Institute 2013 Hispanic Value Survey that asked, how do you think is a better way to produce economic growth? Uh, more government spending on uh, education and infrastructure, uh, or lowering taxes and reducing spending on government programs. Hispanics overall supported the bigger government alternative, 60 to 35. That suggests that self-deportation aside, somewhere in the 31 to 35% range is about where a Republican party that's dedicated to a voluntary society, even as loosely and imperfectly implemented as it is right now, that's about the natural ceiling among Hispanics as they are constituted now. Again, the question being, if you're looking at a two to 10 year political strategy, they are not a constituency that's waiting to vote for a soft or a hardcore libertarian uh, agenda. And there are no other groups out there besides them that you can point to that say they are ready to significantly curtail across the board government power in all fields simultaneously, which is what a hard libertarian wants. So what do you want in the medium or short term as a libertarian uh, political actor? Um, you have to pick your battles. What do you care about most? Do you care most about social issues, you know, like legalizing gay marriage, uh, keeping abortion legal, legalizing drugs, um, uh, privacy issues, uh, surveillance state, things like that. Do you care most about reducing American military spending? Well, if that's what you care most about, then you probably should form a strong alliance with these young wealth creators because their center-left libertarianist views will align with you. They will be your allies in that battle. Now, they will not be your allies in the battle to significantly curtail the welfare state although they tend to think uh, less well of redistributive programs, they also tend to view government action to help the compassionate as being morally just. So if you care about social issues, privacy, reducing the military, you should seek alliance with center-left new generation voters. Um, do you care most about taxation and business regulation? Do you really say, OK, what we really need to do is stop tax increases for the next 10 years and focus on reducing regulation on, uh, uh, on wealth creators? Uh, but we shouldn't care as much about spending, and we shouldn't tackle the military. Well, then you should probably join the establishment GOP, because they really don't want to increase taxes very much. They'll pursue, pursue a mildly deregulatory agenda, and again, Change will be incremental or more, in this case, of harm present, prevented. But you could actually make progress on that. Do you really care about reducing domestic spending? That regulation is not something you really want to move on, and taxation is not as big of an issue as long as it's not tax increases. But you really want to cut the size of government spending at all level. 
well, then you should probably join up with the Tea Party and kind of hold your noses that half of them are social conservatives who will say things about uh, gays that would drive you batty, uh, because they're your allies in that fight. Again, you'll give up what you want in other fights, but you might actually get something on domestic spending as they form the idea on that. Um, I have a lot more I could say, but my time's running up. And so what I, I just want to focus on then to conclude is libertarian-ish ideas are growing, but nowhere near fast enough to uh, see that a great leap forward into even a Rand Paul economic or across the board agenda is likely uh, to be seen in the next few years. Libertarians who want to focus on the long-term battle ought to ignore my, uh, my short-term advice completely because you're not fighting in the midterm. But if you want to be politically relevant in the midterm, like Rand Paul, who's made peace with social conservatives in many ways because he represents Kentucky and is trying to add to rather than disrupt the existing Republican Party coalition, you will have to make similar choices. And what you care most about will determine which people you will imperfectly be in alliance with in this highly imperfect world that we call America. Thanks. Thanks very much, Henry. We're going to go to questions and answers now. We have a 30-minute uh, time slot for that. I want to return to, in a second, but I want to ask the first question that in my own mind was prompted by uh, Henry's remarks and uh, some other things I've thought about in the past about the Republican Party, which is this. Let's imagine that uh, what I think Henry thinks is probably not likely, but let's imagine it happens uh, and Rand Paul is elected president. The nature of the case when you become president is you have to stock an administration. You have to staff it. You have to have people that, and then who are assistant secretaries and secretaries and so on. And then they end up both proposing and carrying out policies. And above all, they end up fighting out these coalitional battles inside the administration, right, as well as inside Congress. My question is, isn't the libertarians as a movement and as a group particularly poorly situated to fight those battles? What do you expect that how well those coalitional strife and struggle will go? And I say that because, in fact, libertarians have by and large stayed clear of political engagement. Am I correct about this? Or could we even expect mostly a Rand Paul administration being staffed by people who have lots of political experience, say, staffers from the Heritage Foundation. <laughs> or Henry. Um, Ronald Reagan's administration found the question of staffing to be very challenging, precisely because in order to effectively change the course of government, you need somebody who understands it. And by definition, if you've been out of power for a long, long time, no matter how much theoretical knowledge you've built up, it's very hard to apply that hitting the ground running. Um, what I suspect would actually happen is what would happen in the Reagan administration, which is that if Rand Paul were to be elected president, he would have made implicit coalition deals with people who are not hardcore libertarians. I mean, these days, um, it is a absolute uh, requirement on the social right that social conservatives have important policymaking roles in the Department of Health and Human Services so that they deal with family planning and abortion issues. A Rand Paul presidency that ignored that request would immediately rupture that coalition. But to grant that request would necessarily mean to advance a non-libertarian perspective. To the extent that you, he wanted to put in libertarians, there would be there are some from the Reagan administration and others that would be politically uh, capable of jumping in. There are others who have not had that experience but would welcome it and then learn well. But when you're in government, um, you have to compromise on a daily basis. And that means I think the most important challenge to a Rand Paul presidency staffing is uh, finding people who dispositionally are willing to deal with people who dramatically disagree with them and not pick a fight, but rather try and either pick the fight you want to fight or uh, find mutually agreeable ways to get along. Uh, because the alternative is that there'd be too many political scandals and you'd very quickly restaff your administration with people who can deal with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just uh, uh, to expand on that. I mean, I, I actually had under my libertarian appeal that libertarians do have to realize they have to pick their battles uh, and they do have to 
get people elected, when I say libertarians, I mean generally the freedom-oriented folks, Reaganites, Goldwater rights, they have to get people elected. And once they're elected, whether it's to Congress or to the presidency, um, they, need to, uh, they need to form coalitions. They need to be able to get things uh, uh, done. And quite often that is tough for libertarians because most of them are more theoretically oriented. They do like what I've done for like three decades, basically write books and do studies. And they're all wonderful too, by the way. But, <laughs> you know, the point is that's not operational. But I do think that you would find people who could do that. Um, some of them would be folks from, frankly, the Cato Institute. I, by the way, I used to work at the Heritage Foundation. And of course, Heritage was well known for having people going back and forth to and from the administration. Uh, and, uh, but, but you would have libertarian. And actually, one of, the, one of the best ones is the late, great Bill Niskanen, who was the chairman of the Cato Institute and was, of course, uh, in the uh, Reagan administration uh, 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 as well. And, and again, you might be able to find some of these issues where uh, you, could, you could have, for example, take, take some of the, the HHS stuff, that you just, the things you just mentioned, okay? I think libertarians could say, okay, look, we want to keep abortion legal and birth control and so forth, but the government shouldn't be paying for it. So maybe we can agree on that much. So if you have an HHS that's saying we don't want government funds going for family planning, yeah, okay. You know, it shouldn't be going to a lot of stuff, and so we're just picking that one out. So, you know, the libertarians might be capable of coming up with these kinds of uh, uh, coalition, uh, 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 you know, uh, strategies. And, and I just, I mean, but I guess my point is, is that that will, ultimately that will be insufficient, which is that if you're making coalitions with people, you will have to endorse things to get their consent on the things that you really care about. You will have to endorse doing things that you don't particularly agree with because you're not strong enough to do otherwise. Let's go to the questions from the audience at this point. So here are some ground rules. Uh, please wait to be called on. Uh, and wait for the microphone. Our two uh, interns here will bring the microphone. Uh, and so it's because our audience watching online can also hear the question. Uh, please announce your name and affiliation, unless you want to remain anonymous for some reason. And please have your question in the form of a question. <laughs> the gentleman on the aisle there, I, or the do near the doorway, part my rudeness for pointing and... Could we turn on the Wait mic? a minute, I don't think the mic is on. Hello? There we yes. go. Okay. Good. Got Thomas. it. Uh, as I recall, Reagan uh, supported banning all abortions, including a human life amendment that would have defined a one-day-old embryo as a person, which yep. is something I don't know of any, modern, any contemporary Republican today endorsing. And he also signed into law a measure that recriminalized speak gay up sex... Sorry? Okay, yeah, speak into the mic. I can't, can't hear you very Reagan well. was way more conservative than today's Republicans. He, he supported banning abortion, including a human life amendment that would have treated a one-day-old embryo as a person. Mm -hmm. He signed into law a measure that recriminalized gay sex in the District of Columbia. And although I wasn't alive at the time, I believe that Goldwater's 1964 campaign gay-baited one of Johnson's staffers and also uh, that Goldwater backed bans on pornography. So... As, as looking at the past, it seems to me that, that the Reagan-Goldwater Republicans were far to the right on social issues compared to today's Republicans. So I'm a little bit baffled that you hmm. characterize the Reagan-Goldwater Republicans as socially liberal or mixed, which I might wish they were. Mm -hmm. But it, and from my historical recollection of Reagan, uh, I don't recall that being the case. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why I do describe them as mixed. And part of the issue is priority. In other words, uh, yes, uh, Reagan was against abortion and uh, was very strongly against abortion. Uh, by the way, they also, during the Reagan administration, uh, had an anti-pornography study. And there's a famous picture of Ed Meese, who I know pretty well. He's actually a very nice guy. And he's standing at the, in the Justice Department uh, holding up this anti-pornography study, and in the background is the is the statue of justice, topless. And I thought it was a wonderful uh, 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 photograph. Uh, but the interesting thing is, nothing ever came of that. Um, 
and part of my point, and, and so yes, I'm not saying that, the, and by the way, Goldwater was much more libertarian and became more libertarian, by the way, on, for example, issues, of, uh, gay issues and things like that, and very strongly against the religious right. In fact, he famously said he'd like to kick Jerry Falwell's ass. Um, and some of you remember that, uh, you know, as he as he got older. So yes, there absolutely were 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 mixed. But I'm saying that, for example, uh, Ronald Reagan also wanted to abolish the Department of Education. He also wanted to abolish a couple of other government departments. He wasn't able to, but his aspirations were uh, much more libertarian than, say, a Romney, a McCain. Uh, uh, you know, a George W. Bush, some of these other uh, f folks. And again, I think John uh, made that point in talking about, uh, you know, when the Reagan revolution ended and when Republicans decided if you can't beat the welfare status, we, you have to uh, join them. The one thing I want to just to say is that in 1978 in California, there was an initiative to um, ban gays from teaching in public schools that was supported by um, the NACE then in infancy, uh, social right. Ronald Reagan opposed it. And um, uh, the measure went down to defeat 45% to 55% probably in no small measure than that. The then still popular California governor uh, came out on the side of personal liberty. Hmm. Uh, gentleman right here in the fourth roll up. Yes, you. <laughs> mm -hmm. And if you want to direct your uh, question to Please mention either speaker or both can answer. Hi, Dominic Ballone, American University. Uh, neither of you really spoke of the uh, Dick Cheney wing of the Republican Party, um, unfettered executive, um, expanded national security state intervention abroad. Is that relevant anymore? Does it exist or is it gone? Um, and then secondly, just to uh, talk a little bit about the wealth creators, um, what would a liberty message be to someone who maybe finds themselves um, on the wrong end of the socioeconomic divide and says, if you give too much liberty to the wealth creators, well, you're just transferring concentrated power from Washington to Wall Street, and that hurts individuals? I, uh, I'll answer the first part of that. Oh. You want to go first? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Let me just uh, on on the first one. Yeah, I intentionally left out the national security discussion because I think in terms of American politics today, it's not the thing that people are really juiced about. They they are in the sense that they look at Obama and they perhaps see him as a weak individual, which I think he is. By the way, they see a lot of the problems being caused because you know he didn't have a strong reputation. So Putin says, "I can do anything I pretty much want." he's gonna do nada. Uh, and, and so I think there's a dissatisfaction, but I don't think the Americans have a great appetite for the Cheney wing of the, uh, of, of, the, of the party. I am concerned, by the way, about some of the anti-Semitism that's coming out in the wake of Israel's uh, uh, you know, responses to Hamas, but that's a different issue. In terms of the wealth creator question that you mentioned, I'll, I'll, I'll say two things. First of all, the notion of a free market system is that I can start as I did as a working class kid. You know, my dad drove a truck. I had to work my way through college, working in stores, scrubbing toilets, doing all that kind of good stuff. I'm from a, my mother's a Italian, you know, a heritage. That was kind of the American dream. You work your way up, you work your ass off, okay? So if I'm on the lower part of the socioeconomic ladder, if, I under, if we have, you know, if I understand what the situation, the, the, the system is, that's what I want. And here's where, again, a smart Republican will do something that, by the way, Cato was doing back when I was here in the 90s, going after crony capitalism, making the distinction between true free markets, okay, and a cronyist system, which is often report, is supported by Republicans and Democrats, and even more by Democrats these days, you know, where it it's really is corporatism. Uh, and so the problem is with concentrated wealth is the wealth in many ways is concentrated because the government <clears throat> is involved bailing out banks, bailing out auto companies, protecting certain industries, giving Solyndra, uh, uh, you know, government uh, handouts, et cetera, et cetera. So I think a very powerful argument that a Republican can make, certainly a libertarian Republican, but maybe even, uh, you know, a smarter establishment Republican is that we've got to get away from this cronyism. We have to understand, because that, that's something that, if you want to talk about polling, across a political spectrum, people on the right don't like it, Tea Party folks don't like it, right? Bailing out your neighbor, bailing out auto companies. 
and the Occupy Wall Street people don't like it. So there's something that I think a smart uh, Republican or Democrat, if they want to be smart, uh, would do is go make the distinction between true free markets earning your way and a cronyist system, which is what we have today. Henry. Yeah, I would concur with that. There's no evidence in the data that uh, national security Republicans or Dick Cheney Republicans are a significant part of the Republican primary electorate. They're at best secondary or tertiary issues for other factions. There is evidence that some of Ron Paul's and John Huntsman's support uh, before Huntsman dropped out was motivated by um, desire to pull troops home from Afghanistan and restrict involvement overseas. It's a small but noticeable group, and I would expect that uh, Rand Paul will make overtures to that group in a way that uh, he's a skilled politician that won't rupture, completely rupture co uh, coalition uh, possibilities with all but the extreme national security hawks. And in fact, we're already seeing that because he sees where the energy is and it's not on the Dick Cheney wing. Did you want to comment on the other question about? No, I no. didn't. I just wanted to say that. Uh, gentleman in the middle. Uh, my name is Steve Hankin. And I have a kind of comment question. Um, it, it seems to me that the the real problem with the with our, our elections at the national level is that people tend to vote based on these social issues. They're totally folk, they decide everything based on one social issue that means something to them, based on, on uh, the idea that, that both Democrats and Republicans do that. My suggestion is that in order to get people to vote based on non-social issues in national elections, that we have a party that is that's that takes this kind of position on social issues. They're all should be decided at the local level, and the party has no position on on the social issue. This will make people. This, this will make people focus on the on the other issues and maybe change a lot of groups that you think are sort of static in the way they're going to vote. What do you think of this idea? This, this, by the way, was Bill Niscanon was mentioned. This was one of his policy recommendations. Let's go to Henry first this time. Huh. You know, that's really a question uh, for uh, people uh, to, to decide as a matter of practical politics. Um, th that party would probably be more of a protest party than a winning party in the sense that the reason people talk about social issues is because there's a lot of people who care about social issues. And if you're in a two-party system where you have to cobble together coalitions um, from different factions, and 5% of Americans really care about gay marriage, and 15% really care about choice, and 10 or 15% really care about life, you're going to talk about those issues. Um, so I would not expect that party <clears throat> to win. Um, the other thing I would want to say is that you cannot underestimate the degree to which Americans do not want to radically undo the um, government regulatory entitlement welfare state. Uh, it does not mean that they do not hold very inconsistent opinions about it, which friends of liberty can exploit. But it does mean that if the question you pose to Americans are, uh, along the lines of the sort of thing that that Ed was talking about, which is I believe that you know the basic idea that government uh, can tax uh, some Americans and give money to other Americans is morally wrong and you ought to reject the entire system because of that, you would find that that appeal is incredibly tiny. I'll just yeah, I just want to add. Uh, uh, one thing about that again, it, it, the thing is it's what in part you're going to have to address what the electorate is interested in. Uh, but what you can do, and I, I, I have a, cha a whole chapter in the, uh, the book on this, is you can try to seize the moral high ground by saying, look, a lot of you uh, folks are concerned maybe about gay marriage or about some of these things. What you really should be concerned about is individual autonomy or what you should really be concerned about is personal responsibility. Most people, uh, I think on the conservatives as well as libertarians, would be concerned that we have a society in which people are uh, less and less responsible. They, don't, they, they, they think that the government should be wiping their nose and tying their shoes for them and so forth. This is not a morally good thing. 
Uh, there are things you can do where, where, where we can take, or I should say freedom lovers can take the moral high ground uh, and, you know, and, and, and sort of, you might say, divert some of the value folks away from what I'd consider to be very limited sort of things like of gay marriage and to more profound and important uh, value issues. And I have a whole chapter about, about that. Gentleman over here to the left and about four up. Mm -hmm. on, the, on the wall. <laughs> Hi, uh, Pat Spann, just representing myself, I guess. The, um, Mr. Olson, I, um, I've always been amazed that I see these stats about uh, Hispanic voters and attitudes towards the GOP. Is, there, is it ever held on whether uh, they're just uh, interviewing citizens. I can see why the illegals don't particularly like the GOP, but is there is there ever any is there do they hold for the fact that these are just questions of um, citizen Hispanics? Yeah, there are um, plenty of uh, polls that distinguish between uh, non-legal and legal citizens or, or non-legal residents and legal citizens and legal citizen Hispanics um, are um, uh, as you might expect, the group among Hispanics who cares most about legalizing immigration are the non-legals. Mm -hmm. um, citizen Hispanics actually are much less motivated by that issue mm -hmm. uh, than non-citizen Hispanics. Uh, but citizen Hispanics tend to be, um, uh, by libertarian standards, quite to the left. Even the Cubans of Miami, which are the most Republican voting group, uh, hold uh, very centrist to center left viewpoints. And in fact, if you look at the National Journal's rankings of liberal and conservative uh, uh, members of the House of Representatives, uh, the Cuban Republicans are almost always at the most liberal end, which is to say at the center of Congress and the most liberal Republicans. Uh, and even people who don't, you know, um, Jaime Herrera Butler, who represents the Washington state suburbs of Portland. Mm -hmm. It's called Clark County um, uh, across the um, Columbia River. Tends to be more centrist uh, than others representing similar districts. Raul Labrador, mm -hmm. who represents Idaho and uh, is a Hispanic Republican Tea Party favorite, also tends to get more centrist scores, although still strongly uh, not as center left as the, uh, or the purely centrist as the Miami Cubans are. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a long way of saying, yeah, it's the citizens too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll, I'll just add one quick uh, uh, point there. Uh, I, I, I take Henry's uh, distinction between short, sort of short, medium term and long term. And one of the things I'm saying is that if Republicans or Friends of Freedom, let's say, start to, and had been all along, say, making arguments uh, about for example, immigrants and pointing out that immigrants represent generally the best of American values. That is you, the notion of self-improvement, of you know working hard, and by the way, uh, not particularly liking bureaucracy. I mean, you know, the, the the obsession of a lot of conservatives. Well, well, they broke the law. Yeah, they didn't fill out the. The, the damn government paperwork. Since when are you so obsessed with government paperwork and the importance of government paperwork? You know, and uh, my point is that if, if in the long run um, the Republicans had making these arguments, yeah, it might take them a while to change uh, uh, a lot of Hispanics on some of these other issues. For example, should government be larger and offering more services or not? But there'd be a bigger wedge and a bigger opportunity to do that if you say, here are the values on which we're fighting, okay? Here's the values on which we agree, and now over time, let's see where we can take this. Gentleman right here on the right. Uh, my name is Lloyd Hand. Uh, my professional affiliation with King and Spalding, but my question and my participation is not reflecting the law firm. Uh, I heard uh, a political operative prominent on a talk show not too recently or, or, uh, make the comment uh, based on uh, the very thought-provoking, uh, stimulating presentation to both of you, particularly your statistic studies, that uh, the Republican Party has to really decide if it wants to be a national party or a regional party. Hmm. Uh, you think that's valid? 
Henry first. Henry, yeah. The Republican Party appeal right now is very strong for uh, 45% of the nation, uh, highly concentrated in the South, the border states, and rural states in the West. It's not going to win the presidency back until it becomes more appealing to a larger group of people. Uh, that does not mean that it cannot have a significant influence on the direction of national life because of that regional concentration. But um, it does, if it wants to have the presidency, if it wants to have comfortable majorities in the United States Senate, it must change its appeal in some way so that it can enable that. The current party base or the current party as structured in its platform and its focus is not capable of winning national elections on a consistent basis, except in times of extreme difficulty for the other party. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that there's there's a lot to that. And again, if you look at the local level, you do see that a Repu that certain Republicans, for example, a Schwarzenegger can win in California. He didn't do a very good job there. You can see in Wisconsin, uh, you know, a Republican governor who can actually face down the unions. Uh, you can see, you know, and you can go through and you can look at the local level. You can see, ah, here's a Republican governor who's actually doing something because the people elect them. And they do tend to be more moderate. Uh, at, at, at the local level. I mean, uh, Chris Christie, I believe, is, is pro-life, and in a sense, that's a, an anomaly in the, North, uh, in the Northeast. Um, but what I'm saying here is that the Republican Party is, that's not my whole premise, the Republican Party uh, is broken. It does have these, fi these factions fighting, and that somebody has to be the, you might say, political entrepreneur to try to figure out how to pull them together and it might mean pushing aside the Huckabees. Uh, I think that's what Rand Paul is trying to do with his outreach to Silicon Valley that I wrote about just yesterday and, and, and so forth. A lot of them, the smart ones know they have to do that. Yeah, but one thing I do want to say is that um, when you look at the swing states for the presidency, uh, barring a massive realignment where social conservatives just leave en masse and go somewhere and another group comes in en masse, um, the swing states of the presidency are states in the Southwest where the uh, key vote uh, group, the fastest growing group is Hispanics, mm -hmm. or the industrial Midwest where uh, none of these new groups are really, you know, if you're a young college graduate, you're not flocking to Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. uh, the Midwest is one that's still the single largest voting group are people who make less than $50,000 a year who are white and didn't graduate from college. So let's take a look at what the Republican governors have done in those states. Every single Republican governor in Nevada, in Colorado, in Wisconsin, in Michigan, in Pennsylvania has endorsed Medicaid expansion. Every single one. What does that tell you about the politics in their states? Lady on the aisle. Oh, <laughs> then David. Hi, um, Lindsay Holden, Medill News Service. Um, I'm curious what the panel thinks of um, Paul Ryan's new anti-poverty plan and its implications for the Republican Party as a whole. I, I can jump. I blogged on National Review Online's The Corner uh, about that in a piece called Paul Ryan 2.0. Um, I think it is an important step in dealing with the Republican parties and the mm -hmm. conservative movement's um, Achilles heel, which is the compassion issue. Uh, Mitt Romney, uh, the exit poll uh, asked people, which of four characteristics do you prefer in a president? Strong leader, mm -hmm. has strong values, has a plan for the future. And 74% uh, of Americans picked one of those three. And Mitt Romney won each of those categories by between nine and 23 points. He and Paul Ryan, since it was the Ryan Romney ticket, or Romney Ryan ticket, Paul wishes it might have been the other way around, but, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. lost 21% uh, of the people picked the last characteristic, mm -hmm. and Romney Ryan lost that group by 63 points. And that's uh, people who thought that that most important characteristic was cares about people like me. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll add to that. Uh, Ryan, of course, was a protege of Jack Kemp. Uh, Jack Kemp was a smart Republican. I knew him personally. I had disagreements with certain things. But, I mean, he liked to say that he had showered with more blacks than most Republicans even knew because he was a quarterback, of course, and uh, an athlete. He 
you know, he went and he worked in the projects. He went and said, we should, you should own your home. The government shouldn't own your, you know, this public housing, you should own it. He, he really made an effort to do exactly that sort of thing. And to do it in, where he's advancing free market principles, you should say that, well, you know, some of what Ryan has in his plan is not complete laissez-faire. Yeah, but here's a test. In which direction is a policy moving? Is it moving in the direction of less government regulation, more personal autonomy, more private ownership, and so forth? Or is it moving in the other direction? And Ryan is smart to try to come up with policies that, uh, that do, exactly, uh, do exactly that. Let me finish uh, with the following question, oh. uh, which I hope is provocative, which is this. Uh, the return to the six elections. The Democrats lost five out of six between 68 and 92. Hmm. During, at the front end of that, they ran George McGovern. At the back end, they ran Bill Clinton. And that Bill Clinton's first victory was the beginning of the five of six run I mentioned in which Republicans have lost, essentially. They won one tie and uh, lost the others, and won a straight majority once in 2004 out of the last six elections. So is the next Republican nominee, who is the most likely to be, I guess I would say, George McGovern among the Republican candidates, and who is most likely to be Bill Clinton? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, I think the, the looking at the Republican candidates who appear to be running right now, and based on what they have said to date, there are no Bill Clintons and there are plenty of candidates for George McGovern. <laughs> wow. Um, I don't know. I would think, I would think that, uh, frankly, a smart Paul Ryan could be your Bill Clinton. By the way, I, when, I, when I was at the Heritage Foundation, Bill Clinton was a governor and he had a reputation as being a moderate Democrat. And so he, and of course he ran on that reputation as I'm not an extremist like uh, George uh, McGovern. And I think Paul Ryan does have that potential if he can, in a sense, shake the, uh, uh, the, the well, I was going to say shake, shake the, 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 the unfortunate reputation of being on a ticket with Mitt Romney, who really, one of the things that really screwed him up is, the, is that the Democrats made hay with the 47% remark. He said, you know, supposedly off the record, he thought that 47% of people are on the government take and you might as well forget about them. They're never going to vote for us anyway. And that made him seem uncaring, uh, unsympathetic. His number was right, but if he if he had been making the you know a, a proper presentation, what he would have said is forty seven percent of the American people are in some kind of government assistance. This is not a good thing. We know that they really would prefer not to be there. We as the GOP want to help them, you know, uh, get off the government dole, so to speak, or da, da 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 That would have been the proper way to do it. But because he said this off the record, they really made hay with it. I think a Paul Ryan, if, if he could, you know, sort of overcome that, could be that sort of person. But I still have a lot of uh, hope, maybe this is uh, naive hope, uh, for someone like a Rand Paul, who seems to be doing the intelligent thing, uh, he's speaking to black groups. He's, uh, uh, you know, uh, he's he's better on Hispanic issues than some of the others. He's reaching out to these new wealth creators and young people. So I still have a lot of hope for him. We shall see. On that note, a note of hope. We <laughs> will go to our next phase, which. Uh, our lunch will be held on the second floor. Up the spiral staircase will be in the George Yeager Conference Center. On your way, the restrooms are on the second floor uh, along the yellow wall. And the book today we've discussed is The Republican Party's Civil War Will Freedom Win by Ed Hudgens, and joined by our commentator, Henry Olson. And I'd like to join you in thanking both our commentators. Thank you, John.